Now, I would like to make a somewhat provocative comparison. South Korea versus Australia. Now, in 1953, at the end of the Korean War, South Korea was one of the poorest countries on Earth. Back then, Australia was a rich, prosperous country. Australians, on average, had 12 times the income of South Korea. Korea had almost no universities or research left after all the damage of the war. Australia had a whole bunch of excellent universities. So if I asked you in 1953, which of these two countries do you think would be a technological powerhouse in the 2020s, which one would you have gone for? I think most people would have said Australia, for sure. What hope has Korea got? But of course, Australia back in the 1950s, its economy was dominated by mining and farming, and its economy is still dominated by mining and farming. Whereas South Korea has gone on to become a technological powerhouse. Companies like Hyundai and Samsung are world leaders in silicon chips and advanced technology. This is part of the general what's called the East Asian growth model because a number of countries in East Asia have achieved this progression from incredible poverty to high technology superpowers. Japan was the first, starting in the Meiji Restoration and then again after the Second World War. Then you've got South Korea, Taiwan and Singapore. And now to some extent China, though it's still a work in progress for China. How did they do it? And why didn't Australia do it? Well, the model was what's called export-led growth. These countries did not develop their high technologies to sell to their own people. They developed the high technologies to sell to Western countries. So it was crucial that in these stages there was a free market and that Japan, for example, was allowed to export its transistor radios to Europe and the USA. This was a crucial factor because if you just produce things for your own market like North Korea did, you have a closed border, then you, there's no incentive to be competitive. Because if you're trying to sell your things in the world market, you have to be good at it. That puts a lot of pressure on companies to innovate and do things really well. Whereas if you're in a closed market like North Korea or Russia, oh, you can produce any old crap and people will have to buy it because they've got no alternative. Initially, low wages are crucial. So all these countries started off by being a place where Often Western countries could produce things very cheaply using the advantage of uh, cheap labour. All these countries had huge numbers of agricultural workers on subsistence wages who would happily move to the cities and take these new jobs. They weren't very good jobs, they were exploited and worked very hard for almost no pay, but it was still better than being back on the farm. So to begin with, all these countries tend to make uh, cheap plastic crap as it was often thought of. And that got their industries going. That paid for them to have infrastructure. They got used to manufacturing things. They had factories. They had engineers. And then they decided to move up market. They didn't want to remain a country that produces cheap, crappy goods. They wanted to make more expensive ones they could charge more money for. So they worked in the different companies and the government worked very hard to identify industries of the future. For example, in Japan or South Korea, it was silicon chips and electric vehicles. Then, how did they get these industries going? Well, to begin with, they tried very hard to identify the best companies in the world, which at that point were mostly American companies, and get these American companies to set up joint ventures and production facilities in countries like South Korea, Taiwan, China, and so on. So uh, South Korea or Taiwan might invite Texas Instruments to set up a factory that makes dramatic, dynamic random access memory chips. And to lure these companies, they can offer them cheap labour, labour that won't go on strike because the union, these were authoritarian countries at the point, they, they, anyone would be scared of losing their job if they went on strike. And they would give the, the government would help them by making sure there were no problems about getting permission to la land use. Sometimes they would get away with more pollution there, they didn't have to worry about so much environmental controls. And so once the, and of course there's cheap labour, they can get really cheap people who work long hours. So once the companies come, you can then, by a joint venture, start learning how to do things and slowly start having more and more input yourselves, um, have your managers trained in this high technology industry, and then, with the aid of 
cheap government loans that governments would encourage banks to loan money cheaply to these new high-tech enterprises. You can then start not merely to duplicate and compete against the American companies, but actually to go past them. Uh, and now companies like TSMC or Samsung invest very heavily in research and development and are clearly technologically well ahead of the United States. So benefits, you need low interest loans, which are really important for any long term investment. Government support, low wages. There was also a fair bit of espionage that you often spy on American companies and try and learn their trade secrets. Uh, China is famous for doing this, but Japan also did it back in the day quite a lot and probably South Korea and Taiwan as well. But they had other ways. They would often hire back people who'd worked for these companies. So all of this for these countries has worked extraordinarily well and brought them up to technological superpower status. Could Australia have done this? Well, I think probably not. I mean, one issue is, as this graph shows, that Australia was already a fairly rich country back in 1960. And even to this day, Australia is considerably richer per capita than South Korea. So Australia has not done badly at all without the high-tech industries. But the fact that Australia was already a rich country back then is one of the problems. It meant that the government wasn't that bothered about it. If you're a very, very poor country with no natural resources, you've got to develop industry to get food on the table and stop from starving. So there was a really strong incentive for these governments and the companies to focus very hard on this. Whereas Australia was already rich, uh, it wasn't a top priority for the government. Also, that means that if you had tried to set up a semiconductor plot in Australia, you would have had to deal with trade unions, you would have had to deal with high land prices, and you would have to pay decent wages. Whereas if you set up in South Korea, the people earned almost nothing, they're not going to go on strike, and the government is falling over itself to support you. So it would actually have been very hard for Australia to have followed the East Asian growth model, and maybe it didn't need to because it was already a rich country and has become richer still. In percentage terms, it's gone from being 12 times richer to only about twice as rich, but it's still a nice place to live. So this is a strategy that's definitely worked for many countries, and other countries are trying it now. So can India, in particular, follow the same path? A lot of the Gulf states are trying very hard. Um, Bangladesh, can it go from manufacturing cheap textiles to actually climbing the technology chain? Even China, it has a few really good high-tech companies, but most of the economy is still pretty backward. Can it actually bring itself to be a high-income country rather than a middle-income country? Nobody knows.